Uh, in studio with us right now, Teresa McCabe from WVU Medicine, Berkeley Medical Center, Jefferson Medical Center. Good morning, Teresa. Good morning, everybody. And you brought with you a guest to making a debut on our program. I did. I did. This is Dr. Tom Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, he has been with us since January of this year. Uh, he is the dean of the WVU School of Medicine Eastern Campus and also serves as the chief medical officer for WVU Medicine East, the hospitals, and our um, physician clinics here. So, Welcome to the program. He's a VIP. <laughs> a <bit. laughs> he is a VIP. <laughs> you know, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I understand a retired Major General. Right. Which puts you and Mr. Uh, Admiral Bill Stubblefield on a very interesting equal footing, as I understand. We're going to spend the whole morning <laughs> talking about military ac acronyms. You won't understand the thing we're saying, but we're going to have a wonderful conversation. Yeah. Just feel free to toss a few out there whenever you wish. Yep. And we'll, the rest of us will remain silent, <laughs> <laughs> which is Maria, hard for us. Yeah, I was right? going to say, I'm not going to put my money on either one of that. <laughs> I think we get along fine until the first week in December, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, the old yeah. Army-Navy game. Right? Army-Navy game. Yeah. Uh, how did you wind up uh, back here in the area and uh, with WVU Medicine? You know, I think um, just fortunate. I mean, I had an opportunity. Uh, President Gee and uh, Dr. Clay Marsh uh, talked to me about coming back to West Virginia. You know, I'm from West Virginia originally and went to school there in Morgantown. And uh, this was a great opportunity. And so I said, you know, this is something I need to do. So I, I moved up here from the D.C. area. And I haven't looked back. It's been wonderful. Well, very nice. Uh, we've heard about your background. Could you tell us a little bit about some of your experiences from life that have uh, shaped you to be the man you are today and the position that you are today? Uh, sure, Rob. Uh, I, you know, I was an Army um, physician. I actually started out as a, as a dentist. I was trained at West Virginia University in the dental school. And then I, after some time in the Army, I went back to medical school there at West Virginia. And uh, I served as a, uh, an Army surgeon for a number of years. Um, you know, was um, had the opportunity to command at multiple levels, and uh, as you mentioned, I retired as a as a two star, and uh, was then selected to be the president of the Uniformed Service University, which is is kind of like the the Department of Defense's West Point for doctors, if you will, and um, finished my term there, and then uh, we did some other things. You know, the first time in a long time in my entire life, I hadn't been a, a federal employee, so I had the opportunity to go to Ukraine and do some other things that I wanted to do, and then. Uh, was uh, in discussions with uh, President Gee and, and Dr. Marsh and, and uh, uh, Dr. Wright, and uh, this opportunity presented itself. And I actually was driving back from Morgantown to D.C., and I came through this area, and I never really spent much time here. And uh, as, I, as I came through here and spent some time here in this area, I thought, this is great. So I asked about it, and they said, yeah, we really, we really want to start you know, uh, investing and in building you know, the West Virginia medicine capability in the Eastern Panhandle. So here I am. Bill. Yeah, looking at your resume, uh, uh, Commanding General, Western Region uh, Medical Command Center, Surgeon General, U.S. Forces Afghanistan, Assistant Army Surgeon General, and Chief of the U.S. Army Medical Corps, deployed numerous times in support of combat operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Panama. Uh, very, very impressive. Uh, what were we doing in Panama? Well, that was Operation Just Cause. Yeah, back in 89 when uh, we were after Noriega, okay. and I was in the 82nd Airborne Division then. But, uh, you know, it's it's funny, Bill, you get this. You're a servant leader yourself, Admiral. So, uh, you know, you understand where we're coming from yeah. on that. So, um, you know, I, uh, no regrets. I mean, I had a great, a great career, a great experience, worked with some wonderful people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a huge advocate for military medicine and uh, what we're able to do. Military medicine typically lets, you know, leads the way. It does. sets the standard. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that transition, you know, having that that experience has actually helped us here, because I'm definitely tying in West Virginia University to uh, the Department of Defense and military medicine. And that'd be one advantage, I would imagine, being an Eastern Pan Am. It's a fairly quick jump over to D.C. You can keep your contacts alive and well. You know, this is a target-rich environment, yeah. you know, as they say. You know, I mean, you're, we're close to things, but I like to say that. D.C. and these other things are close to us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The VA, of course, we have a very good VA hospital here. Do you yeah. work with the VA at all? I do. As a matter of fact, we had a meeting yesterday. We are uh, uh, designing an affiliation with the VA. Uh, there's really, if you think about it, there's only a couple major medical universities, Ohio State and West Virginia, that don't have uh, really defined ties with the Veterans Administration. So we are going to break that. You know, we're going to become one of them. And the team over there is wonderful. They've got, a, as you mentioned, a, a huge capability that uh, uh, just makes sense that we partner with them. And so we're doing that. 
Very good. So. Tom, Tom, talk a little bit about how then, I mean, was it um, an enormous shift for you to come um, from the military to this position now? How does it differ? Um, what are some of the commonalities? You know, I think I've been asked that before, Maria, but, and I think that what it is is, you know, medicine is very regimented anyway. You know, mm. people think about the military yeah. <laughs> and having a rank structure, but medicine is that way anyway. And so you always have those, those commonalities. And I think that uh, when it comes down to your core mission of taking care of people and training the next generation of healthcare providers, all the doctors and nurses and technicians, uh, that's the same, no matter where you are. That'll be the same mission. So it really isn't that different at all. And I think what we want to do here uh, is, is develop and mature an academic health campus because we want to increase the learning programs for doctors and nurses and technicians so that we are developing that next generation. And when you, when you bring in uh, the new learners in all these fields, you actually enable uh, a lot of uh, innovation. And that's where we're going. We had a uh, guest on a few years back who was an Army surgeon in Iraq and talked about the innovations that happen in hospitals often are innovations that are brought about in war zone hospitals first, sure. including the way patients are triaged and such. Can you relate to some of your experiences with that, whether it was personal or what you were taught or taught yourself and how that has been transferred to the hospitals? No, sure, Rob. I mean, combat is very personal. Um, and combat is also the greatest catalyst for medical innovation. And so that's why the military leads in, in uh, developing new techniques and procedures uh, of taking care of folks. Uh, we have, if you think about it, during the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, we have the all-time lowest case fatality rates. That's not an accident. It's because we got very good at what we needed to do. And those capabilities that we develop in those combat zones are transferred to your cities and towns around the United States so that we get people better at doing what they do. So that's absolutely true. And uh, I also had the opportunity as a, as a, later as a general officer to lead the Traumatic Brain Injury Task Force for the military. And I deliberately made it more than just the military. I made it VA and, and some civilian organizations in there because we have changed the culture with respect to those injuries. We developed um, actually algorithms and protocols, event-driven protocols. We shared that with the NFL, for example. So you've changed the culture with respect to those injuries. And Bill, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. When yes, we were kids, right. you hit your head, you just shake it off and get back in the game, right? Um, so that's a positive thing that's happened. I also led the um, Pain Management Task Force, which uh, really changed our trajectory from um, a pill for every ill mentality to you know opening the opportunities for folks to get acupuncture, acupressure, massage therapy, other than narcotics for their injuries. And that's been a game changer for the military and for our patients. Let's talk about medical school mm -hmm. specifically and the recruitment of new students to enter medical school, the costs of medical school, and, and the costs alone may prohibit some people from pursuing that career. What is WVU doing about that sort of thing as it undergoes cuts in uh, many departments? Right. WVU has, uh, you know, their, their tuition is, is really kind of the mid-level tuition, so it's not nearly the, the top of the, of, the, of the order there if you will. They've got about, to date, I think I looked at last week, about 4,200 applicants. Uh, they close out the application for this season around the 1st of November. So they'll hit about 5,000 applicants for those slots in Morgantown, which is about normal, so they haven't dropped off at all. One thing that I did notice, by the way, Rob, is the uh, number of West Virginia students that are applying to medical school has dropped off, and uh, we'd like to do something about addressing that. So I think the number of applications is up. Uh, the issue with, uh, with medical school and the cost of it is there are a number of programs that didn't exist when, when I was going to medical school that can help enable you. Like I, I was on a military scholarship, and the scholarship programs that they have are, there's many more today in various, various areas because people will join you if you give them something. They stay because they believe in your mission. They believe in the, in the group, the team, you know, the work that you're doing, that kind of thing. So I think that... Um, uh, the scholarship opportunities for students is much greater, and they're looking at that right now to defray the costs. And West Virginia has been very, uh, I think, a leader in that, in that field. Are we in a, a crisis stage with physicians in this country? And I'm just going to relate my own personal experience. So many of the physicians and longtime doctors that I had who were, I don't think, at retirement age, retired yeah. and have moved on and been replaced by 
uh, physicians assistants and and, uh, and and nurses of various rank and such yeah. uh, who nurse practitioners who I hadn't previously been seeing but since the retirement of the doctors that I've been going to for years I now see routinely no absolutely we are at a crisis by 2030 uh, we're gonna have a, a profound crisis shortage of physicians in this country and uh, you are seeing it's interesting because you're seeing the development of, of um, advanced practice uh, providers, mm -hmm. uh, nurse practitioners, and things like that, which I, th I think is a good thing, absolutely. We're able to uh, get more experienced and educated and trained folks, you know, taking care of patients, touching patients, which is what it's about. So the number of physicians is shrinking, and it's not that we don't have folks going to medical school. Actually, there's a number of medical schools that are opening up, but it's the number of residency training programs that haven't grown. Those are federally funded, and uh, they need to expand the number of residency programs. That's the training program after medical school that trains you to be whatever flavor doctor you're going to become. But and in, you, I'm me, sorry, Tom. Go ahead, you, you said earlier that the number of West Virginia folks applying for medical school is decreasing. Yes. What is the reason for that, and what can we do about it? Don't know exactly. They're kind of. We had this discussion just last week with the dean's council about uh, you know what do we think this is. I think that there needs to be more outreach, definitely more outreach to, to the students here. Uh, COVID kind of derailed a lot of the trajectories that we had and projections we, we could make on, on uh, student applications. I think that we need to do a better job of reaching into the West Virginia high schools and you know, trying to encourage and enable uh, our young folks to take a look at this. But back to Rob's point, it's not that they're steering clear necessarily steering clear of health care. A lot of them say, you know, this becoming a, a nurse or a, uh, a physician's assistant or something like that is, is a pretty good uh, career also. So they're, they're, some of them are going into other areas of medical care. Um, what we are hurting for is primary care, especially primary care physicians. Well, people just aren't going into that field as much as they used to. Now this, this decrease of going into medical, uh, primary medical care, is that nationwide or is that more focused in areas such as West Virginia? It's nationwide. Nationwide. Yeah, yeah, we're, okay. seeing it, we're seeing a trend nationally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you clearly um, came to WVU Medicine um, on the tail end, some would say, of the COVID crisis. Um, not that it doesn't rear its ugly head again. I know in my line of work, area nursing homes are going back to, you know, um, lots of, um, you know, lots of the things that, that we were happy to get rid of years mm -hmm. ago. Do you see a resurgence? Do you see that happening again at the local hospital? Um, where are we in terms of the, the COVID crisis? Yeah, Maria, it's a great point, and this is a topic of discussion, especially now as you're entering the, you know, the RSV and the flu and the, and the COVID seasons, if you will. Kids are going back to school. You know, people are, the, as the temperatures eventually will drop, not today, <laughs> but they'll eventually drop. Uh, COVID is here to stay. Uh, it is a coronavirus that's here to stay. It will continue to mutate and change where it becomes less lethal uh, in general, but uh, it is here to stay. And so we'll have uh, this fall and winter, we will have a spike in infection. So we're preparing for that. You know, it's inevitable. Uh, and it's not just COVID. You have the other, you know, the other illnesses right. that go with it. Yeah. So, so you can make an argument for, or it is isn't uh, valid that uh, it's very similar to flu in that regard. Is it, does it provide some difficulties that flu does not provide? as far um, as treatment and anticipating what the strains strain is going to be it does you know but as as you know bill with flu it changes every year there's variants of that and so that what they do is they take last year's strain and develop a vaccine uh, and it's kind of a gamble they're saying well hopefully it doesn't mutate too much or change too much so that this vaccine this year will be effective against it and uh, some years we get it right some years it, it doesn't because the the uh, virus itself will mutate and it will be more lethal or potentially cause more illness in some in some areas. So it's kind of a, a shot, but it's the best shot we have. The same with the coronavirus, you know, as they can continue to modify vaccines, now they're, they're recommending boosters for everyone this year. By the way, you can get your COVID booster and your flu shot at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I recommend people do that, especially people that have some health conditions, because if you get infected with this, especially the respiratory uh, issues that people can have with that, um, as we all know, we've all experienced people that have been sick, and unfortunately, we've lost people because of this very serious illness. We hadn't seen it before, so it was new to us, and so your body hadn't 
uh, had a chance to develop the defenses against it. Now, you know, with the vaccines and a lot of us with exposure to it have developed uh, antibodies that will help us to protect us against this virus. And and so now I'm seeing that RSV, which mm -hmm. it appeared in the beginning was much more prevalent among really young children, right. um, is now as serious um, in the elderly and the recommendation that vaccinations for RSV um, in older folks is um, is out there as well. Talk about that. You a bet, little. Maria. I mean, and you know this, you know, with with uh, uh, folks at the at the uh, Panhandle Nursing Home and things that you guys do. By the way, great work over there. I Thank visit you. that. And it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, it's the extremes of life, you know, the very young and the very old that are vulnerable to these infections. And so, uh, or folks that uh, have some kind of concomitant uh, immune deficiency, uh, disease of uh, some other nature, maybe they have a cancer or something like that that makes them more susceptible to these infections. And that's the ones we really push to, to uh, treat and to protect uh, initially. Uh, young, healthy people that are running around can get it, and maybe to them their symptoms aren't anywhere near as bad as they would be in someone sure. who's older with other issues, right? Dr. Tom Thomas, our guest here, the, the dean of uh, WV Medical School. We'll stay on the coronavirus for a moment because this obviously became a very controversial virus for a variety of different reasons, many of which turned political and turned medicine political in the last couple of years. And there is uh, a concern out there, and I would call it a concern from a sizable portion of our population, which feels as though the vaccine has caused many of the heart attacks that you hear among prominent people of a relatively young age, relatively speaking. Uh, yeah. There are some who, after the very famous primetime football game between Buffalo and Cincinnati that saw DeMar Hamlin uh, um, effectively die on a football field before he was revived, there are some who say it was the vaccine that caused his heart to stop. This is an issue that the public right now is not fully bought in on nor trusting. Right. Um, there's no evidence really to support that. There's a lot of, you know, urban uh, myths and legends out there. Hamlin, by the way, made the team again this year. He by did. The way. It's interesting. You know, vaccines are, are one of the main reasons that we can, we've been successful in, in, uh, in fighting these, these uh, diseases and viruses, especially that have been coming around. You know, we talked about the DOD. The DOD is a leader in vaccine development for a reason. And when they had the COVAX or the, uh, the vaccine against COVID was developed in large part with the, the assistance or the direction from the military, not far from here, over Fort Detrick, where they have that capability. And this goes back, you know, vaccines development, it goes with uh, the military all the way back to the you know, Revolutionary War predates that time with uh, the smallpox was the first one, you know, and they use cowpox uh, inoculations and things like that. The reason we can deploy our troops around the world and keep them safe and healthy in large part is because of our vaccine development program. And you know, the issue when you send, uh, no other country can deploy uh, folks around the world like we do. And that, uh, that a big part of that ability to do that is the medical protection that we give them. And vaccines have a key role for that, as they do for our uh, citizens you know, of our society. I mean, they, people, vaccines have enabled us to uh, mitigate the very real risk of some devastating diseases you know we you know we uh, most of us here in the room i don't think any of us in here really ex got to experience things you know that uh, were as bad as they were with polio and other things like that it's the development of those vaccines that really have been game changers for us and uh, so they're key to uh, to protecting the health of, of society public health is is a mainstay of what we're about yeah, picking up on uh, uh, Rob's question, coming at a slightly different angle. Uh, we were in with COVID, we're facing something the nation not faced, including polio, since the 1918 mm -hmm. influenza, where whole communities are wiped out. Uh, the book will eventually be written upon our response, uh, not on the nation, but the, uh, the world's response to COVID. Uh, that book will take several years before it comes out, those, uh, those records. Your sense, though, uh, and this kind of encroached a little bit on politics, did we as a nation address the COVID problem too aggressively, not aggressively enough, or just about right? I think we hit it. Um, I think we were aggressive, but for a good reason. We had to be. You know, you've got a, a pandemic which was affecting folks. And now think about it, a lot of it was the great unknown. 
we didn't understand enough about the virus and everything that was going on. Rob, you had mentioned some of the uh, cardiac uh, you know, uh, symptoms that we're seeing with that, respiratory symptoms that obviously come with that. Um, it's the virus that's, that's affecting that. So we're still learning about this virus, and the virus is still changing. You know, back to the 1918 flu pandemic, I mean, this, this was incredible what happened. We you study that, and you see the devastation. We were getting ready to send U.S. military troops into World War I. We lost many more troops because of flu than we ever did in combat. And that's one of the biggest risks you always have is, you know, we, we talk about the, uh, the health conditions, the disease, and non-battle injuries that are, can really be devastating to the force. So public health uh, issues are, are a huge thing for the military to protect the force. I think that with COVID, uh, it's actually quite incredible what happened with that, the development of the vaccine. It's, it, it was a record time. Uh, they involved the military heavily in that uh, for good reason, because when you want it done, you can call them and they kind of can't say no. So they got after it, and uh, that's that's remarkable what was done. They developed uh, this vaccine and got it out there, disseminated it. What the military brings you is is security, logistics, command and control. And you saw all those in, in, uh, in great display and action uh, during the uh, uh, the fight against COVID. Excuse me, I'd add one more to it, and that's confidence. People have uh, a lot of faith in the military and the way they do things. Yeah, I agree, Bill. One of the things that I was really impressed at, actually, the Stubblefield Institute um, put on a um, seminar um, post-COVID, and one of the things that, that Dr. Clay Marsh commented on was, you know, the criticism that came about when, you know, masks, no masks, and vaccines, and you know, we were, you were learning as you went and what you knew yesterday might not be what you know today and what you're going to know tomorrow. So that was, that was a really good observation, I think, in moving through the stages of the pandemic, just everything changes and yeah. can change in, in the blink of an eye. Absolutely. You know, you're looking at it now from, you know, retrospectoscope, right? Looking back on it, how did we do? Um, I know a few years ago uh, when we had to respond to the Ebola crisis in Western Africa, and that a lot of that was figuring it out as we were doing it. You know, we, we were learning as we were going, and uh, we knew this was a, a very lethal virus. You look at Ebola, for example, uh, when we first started uh, sending troops over there and trying to address this crisis, it was, you know, 95% plus lethal. And now it's down around the 30s. Why is that? You know, well, we've gotten better at protecting ourselves, certainly, but it also is the, the mutation of the virus. And I think you're seeing, you know, you're going to see the same thing with with uh, the COVID uh, virus itself. It's, it's changing as we speak, you know. So before we run out of time, I want to ask uh, Teresa about the Here we go. pickleball well, tournament coming. And this it's is, important. It ties into what we were talking about, indeed. trying to encourage students yeah. to go into medicine. So that we have our Frank Sabato Jr. Uh, MD pickleball tournament scheduled on September the 23rd at the Randy Smith Center in Inwood. And all of the proceeds from this annual event, which is replacing our tennis classic, uh, will go to scholarships for students here in the Eastern Panhandle who are planning on going to pre-med. So um, you surrendered the tennis for the pickleball. We did. The tennis people are it was move time. against you. No, but you know there aren't that many. There are a people. few tennis people, <laughs> but a lot of the tennis people are now pickleball players. Pickleballers. But yes, pickle picklers. That's picklers. Right. picklers. <laughs> yes, if, yes. if someone's looking for a real pro to be their partner will you partner with them <laughs> that would not be the right choice <laughs> i could suggest some other folks she quickly guffawed on you I, I did she did dr thomas thanks so much for coming in uh thank you rob and, and maria and bill i really it's been a pleasure to join this morning and, and uh thanks for what you're doing this is a this is a great venue and i think it uh, hopefully will enlighten some folks and educate some folks and help them out well we appreciate you coming in today it was great to meet you Teresa. thank you very much sure